Let's go ahead and get rolling. Uh, welcome everybody to our October edition of Learning Our Landscape presentation series. Uh, <clears throat> North Olympic History Center in partnership with the Jamestown Squalum Tribe. Uh, as always, the North Olympic History Center acknowledges that we do our work on the lands of the first peoples of this area, the Clallam, Macaw, Quileute, and Ho River tribes. We recognize the rich and important history of the tribal nations in Clallam County. And we commit our work to this land acknowledgement to work collectively to help preserve and share their histories with the public. Um, so today we've got a really special presentation. Um, I think sort of kind of cool that it overlaps with uh, Indigenous Peoples Day week. Um, we're going to start with a short uh, presentation by Ali Taylor, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Jamestown Spalm Tribe. And then following Ali's presentation, I will be giving a talk on Old Patsy's Potlatch at Hadlock um, in 1891. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Ali and we will get rolling. Um, and uh, as always, please just uh, type your questions into the chat box at the bottom. Um, or save them for the end of the presentation, and we'll make sure to save some time um, so that we can get to your questions. Uh, these presentations, as always, are recorded, uh, will be posted on the Jamestown Squalum Tribes uh, Library's YouTube page, uh, which you can find on YouTube at JST Library. Um, so take it away, Allie. Hey, let me just share my screen. So as David said, um, my name is Allie Taylor. I'm the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Jamestown Squallam Tribe. I uh, just wanted to give you a brief update on the Jamestown Squallam archives and collections and some work we've been doing. So just to give you a brief background, the tribe has been curating archeological collections and donated objects for over 20 years. And in 2018 to 2019, Jamestown uh, moved their archives and collections to a secure climate controlled storage facility in Carlsberg. It's the goal of the tribe to eventually create a dedicated collections and archive facility at some point in the future, but there will be an exhibit room in the new tribal library to view these items in person with an anticipated opening date of hopefully fall of next year. Um, the tribe's constantly accepting new donations, but I wanted to make it known that the tribe only accepts items from the Jamestown ancestral territory and or that pertain to Jamestown's cultural history. Um, Cause we just don't have the capacity to take all donations as you'll soon see in these photos. So to give you a brief overview of what the tribe currently has in its ever-expanding collection, the archives facility houses tribal government records, including federal recognition papers, uh, Jamestown enrollment documents, which, which are actually restricted to only tribal members, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, there's also archeological site records, maps, and excavation forms tribal publications, uh, including annual reports, newsletters, and calendars, and photographs from different tribal citizens and families and of tribal events over the years. There's also really old publications and maps, uh, like this one from the founding of Jamestown, and even rare books uh, that are usually in the library, but they're being housed there until the library is finished. So this is what the archives currently looks like. Um, we're storing the rare books there in the back. And uh, um, we still have a little bit of space in the archives, but it's filling up because <laughs> we're getting more and more every day. We have another unit and that's the collections unit. Uh, we house ethnographic collections including baskets, hats, woven objects, some of which that have been identified to be made by Jamestown tribal members and others which don't have a known convenience. Oops, sorry. 
Um, there's also paddles, canoe replicas, combs, and other carved wooden objects, clothing, hats, quilts, and other fabric materials, even four or five boxes of drums and strikers, uh, some of which were made by Jamestown tribal members and one was gifted to the tribe. There's also necklaces and earrings and other beaded artwork. And uh, many of these items were donated by tribal citizens. Uh, others were gifted to the tribe. And uh, there's one collection, uh, the Myron Eels collection that was purchased by the tribe about 20 years ago. Uh, so the tribe also curates uh, collections from several archeology span sites. At least 18 sites uh, are housed at the collections unit. Eight of these sites are still owned by the Navy, but housed within our unit. And uh, these largely represent sites around Indian Island. And the remaining 10 sites collections are owned by the tribe. Uh, looking at these photos, you can see the collections unit is pretty much filled to the brim. The light blue and light brown boxes represent the Navy collections, while the darker brown boxes are from the Squim Bypass site representing the largest uh, Jamestown owned archeological collection. This map gives you a basic idea of where all of these collections came from. Uh, and now what I'm here to tell you about the Jamestown tribe was awarded the Institute of Museum and Library Services American Rescue Plan Grant uh, in October of 2021. Fun funds from this grant are being used in two different ways. One is to catalog our physical collections using so a software called Pass Perfect uh, so that staff and other researchers can easily locate items. And two, uh, is to connect our newly cataloged physical items with their digital representations on the House of Seven Generations. These physical and digital items are not cataloged in the same system. Um, so we have to cross-reference the, their identification numbers and make sure we can, um, so if I go and click on an object in House of Seven Generations, but I wanna see it in person, I need to have the same number. So that's what we're cross-referencing. Um, we're excited to have this process started and we have a pretty good idea of what's in storage, but we don't know exactly what all is there and we don't have an efficient way of finding it. So, uh, we're unable to defend, we're also unable to definitively say what digital objects have physical objects in storage as many of the digital items belong to tribal families. So this project is helping us to tackle some of these issues. Uh, so our first step in this grant work is to catalog the physical archival items using Past Perfect. Um, and prior to cataloging, we first had to identify what collections we had in storage and how extensive they are. And to do this, I completed a full box inventory of the physical collections. I went through the and inventoried everything. So I looked at each collection. I numbered the number of boxes in each collection, uh, the sites they came from, the site names they were associated with when they took possession of these collections and their curation progress. Uh, for these, for the curation progress, I categorized the catalog, sorry, categorized the collections um, based on what had been complete. So if the items had been bagged and tagged using archival materials, or if there were inventory sheets, for the boxes, if there were paper forms, if anything was digitized. Um, and that's what this first photo on the left-hand side is showing, just my box inventory for the whole collections. I also 
documented where exactly each collection was. So I made a little map of what the unit looked like and each collection has a corresponding row and what shelf it's on and what box number it's in. So this slide quantifies the number of boxes in each collection we have. There's a total of 312 boxes, 200 of which uh, we house for the Navy and 112 that are owned by the tribe. Uh, I then broke them down by each archeology span site and or ethnographic and family collection. And from there, we accessioned all collections and past the past perfect software. In other words, we recorded all the collections Jamestown had in their possession and documented the background information for these assemblages and numbered them. Uh, we then prioritized the order which we uh, wanted to catalog these collections based on their curation progress. So we decided to tackle the swim bypass and sure care farms collections as they were the largest collection totally in 70 boxes and they were also the furthest along in their curation process as each box had a paper inventory and they also were cataloged digitally so we just had to transfer the documentation into a new program and uh, then it was cataloged which is easier said than done um, but we currently have the entire collection for both Swim Bypass and the Sure Care Farms cataloged. And the Swim Bypass site had a total of 8,025 items. And the Sure Care Farm had 809 items. So we now have all of those cataloged, which is awesome. Um, we're also nearly done with another site called the Memorial Field Site, which was uh, further along in its curation process about the same as where we were with the swim bypass and sure care farms, but we didn't have anything digitized for that site. So we just um, digitized what we had and uh, we're working on transferring it to the past perfect software. And once we do that, we'll have another 266 items catalog. Uh, and then we have also begun cataloging the next two collections, which have paper catalog records. Uh, we're still in the process of digitizing them. And then we'll transfer those over to the Past Perfect software. And that will bring us an additional 781 objects uh, cataloged. Um, then we'll just have all of the ethnographic collections left over and two smaller archeological collections left to catalog. And after we uh, finish this process, we'll begin the process of cross-referencing any items that are in the House of Seven Generations uh, with our physical records. Uh, we hope to update you again when the project is complete as these objects in storage and online only help to tell Jamestown Clallam's story if they are visible and accessible. Awesome. Thanks so much. And uh, I'm excited to listen to your presentation, David. Take it away. Thanks, Allie. All right, I'm going to work on getting my screen pulled up real quick here. All right, so um, this is a really, really uh, cool presentation for me that's been a long time coming. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about Old Patsy's Potlatch uh, that took place um, on Hadlock Bay in, on July 4th, 1891. Um, the location of this potlatch was actually just uh, west of where the old alcohol plant stands today, if you've ever, ever been over in that area. Um, and actually, the, the large image here on my um, cover page where you can see the canoes lined up in front of the potlatch house, um, that would have been looking, uh, as you looked west, basically from right about where uh, the, al the old alcohol plant is actually located. Um, so before we get too far into it, um, the way that we came about uh, finding these photos is really interesting. Um, 
a couple of years ago when I was working as the, the TIPA for the Jamestown Spalum tribe, uh, a researcher named uh, Deb Ross or Deborah Ross actually contacted me and let me know that she had been doing research on the uh, Squaxin tribe up in the Alaska State Libraries and found a series of photographs that had been mislabeled um, as being taken at Squaxin, which were actually a series of photographs from the potlatch in 1891. Uh, and what's really cool about those photos is in addition to the photographs of the potlatch, we actually have a written account of the entire um, event by Judge James Wickersham that was published in uh, chapter, I think it was chapter 11 of the History of Washington, the Evergreen State from Early Dawn to Daylight, which was published in 1893. Um, and you can actually find uh, a copy of that online as an ebook on Google if you want to look it up. Um, Judge James Wickersham himself is sort of a colorful uh, character from this state's history. Um, he uh, originally moved to Tacoma in 1883. Uh, he actually was arrested as one of the Tacoma 27 who were responsible for driving the Chinese immigrant population out of Tacoma. Um, however, you know, it wasn't... <laughs> It, like many other historic characters, you know, he he did things that weren't necessarily very good. He also did things that um, were good. So, um, you know, he's got both sides on his record. Um, he was he was uh, instrumental in helping the uh, Squawks and Indian tribe organize and form the in, formally uh, incorporate the Indian Shaker Church down in Olympia. Um, he provided a, a number of useful legal services. Uh, after the uh, tribe had put in their initial inquiry and he was at least partially responsible um, for their achieving sta stable corporate existence. So um, I won't talk about him too long just to say that, you know, he's, he's sort of a colorful character in state history. He ended up moving up to Alaska and becoming a, a congressional representative up in the state of Alaska and finished his career up there. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have a photo of Old Patsy. Uh, as we go through the photos of the potlatch, um, you'll see there's there's one um, quite senior aged uh, male individual who could possibly be Old Patsy. He's kind of um, figured centrally in a lot of the photos, but um, none of the photo captions themselves named um, him specifically. So I, I can't really theorize to that. Um, however, we do have a photo of young Patsy, who is the son of old Patsy and also lived on Hadlock Bay. Um, old Patsy himself, his, his Tuana name was Shubald, uh, was from the Squaxin tribe. Uh, he actually moved up to uh, Stylicum and worked in the uh, uh, wood mill up there, the timber mill, um, for many years, uh, made a bunch of money and then moved down to Port Hadlock, just sort of his retirement home. Um, where he and his wife Jenny lived. Um, they had a son named, uh, who's also named Patsy, became later known as Young Patsy. Young Patsy married Lucy Dexter, who is uh, the daughter of Old Dexter from uh, Jamestown Squalum. Um, and for that reason, their descendants are the Patsy family in the Jamestown Squalum tribe today. Um, the Patsy's moved to Hadlock in 1887. Um, they were actually neighbors with the Prince of Wales, who was the son of Chichmahan or Chief Chetsamoka, who moved to Hadlock in 19, oh, I think it was 1941 when the Navy took over Indian Island by eminent domain um, and basically forced the, the tribal families that were living in the north end of Indian Island off of the island. Um, so they moved to Hadlock. Um, the Prince of Wales ended up passing away the next year in 1942. However, the Patsy family still remained on Hadlock Bay for, for quite a few decades after that. Um, so just to give you sort of a frame of reference of where we're talking about today, um, map of Port Townsend Bay created by Joshua Snooski back in 2017 with some of the tribal village sites marked out. Um, you can see all the way up at the north end, Katai, where Port Townsend is located today. Um, then as you move south along the, the west shore of the bay, uh, Nukes Quay, which was uh, uh, Squalum, Chimicum, and uh, Snohomish families uh, all uh, lived in that village site at the mouth of Chimicum Creek. 
Um, and then farther south, you can see uh, Tsitsibus or uh, Tsitsimus. It, it depends on sort of the spelling of it. Um, but was it was the Chimicum name of a large village that stood at Hadlock Bay um, and was sort of, uh, according to historic sources, renowned for being a site um, where tribes would gather for potlatches. Um, tribes from around the Sound would come and gather for potlatches, um, which makes sense when you think about sort of just the location of Port Townsend Bay, Port Townsend, um, Hadlock. You know, it's right there on Admiralty at Admiralty Inlet. Um, really central location for tribes, you know, all the way out to the west end of the Olympic Peninsula and then down South Sound and then north up into the Gulf of Georgia, um, sort of equidistance for all of those different groups to arrive um, here in this central location. Uh, so the these quotes all come directly from Wickersham's account um, describing the, the potlatch itself. Uh, on a grassy spot of about two acres in extent, not more than 10 feet above the salt chuck. Um, Patsy had erected of old boards and refuse lumber, a building 100 feet long by 40 feet wide. Um, and this was pretty typical. Potlatch houses tended to be the largest buildings in the village site because they were meant to house, um, you know, up to hundreds of people. Uh, what's really interesting about this potlatch and these accounts and these photos is that uh, Patsy actually purchased uh, white sailcloth in Port Townsend, and that's what he used to cover the potlatch house, which actually allowed some natural light to filter inside the structure. So um, whereas with a, a more traditional potlatch house or longhouse structure uh, would have been roofed with uh, split western red cedar timbers, planks laid across the roof with a few of them moved to open up uh, holes in the roof where smoke could pass through from the, the cooking hearths. Um, those bu buildings tended to be pretty dim and dark on the inside. It would have been really hard to get good photographs um, within a traditional longhouse um, with the cameras and technology that was available in the, the early 1890s. Um, however, because Patsy uh, roofed his potlatch house with the sailcloth, we have amazing photos um, from inside the potlatch house during the potlatch, which is really rare. Um, so another shot uh, showing you uh, the canoes pulling up in front of the potlatch house. Um, and I, I really love this quote because it really starts to give you an idea of the scale of this event and, and how, how connected these various communities were. Um, you know, people came from Skagit, Snoqualmie, Skokomish, uh, Port Madison, which is the, the Suquamish tribe, um, Nia Bay, Quileute, Quinault, um, and Cayuque, which is now known as the uh, Keokwat over on the uh, western shore of Vancouver Island on the north side of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, by the evening of the 3rd of July, over 500 Indians were camped in and around the potlatch ground, which is a, a pretty substantial number. Um, this top photo is actually, I believe, um, some of the canoes over in Port Townsend. You can see it. I know it's sort of blurry in this image, but the, the canoe itself is loaded up with goods that would have been handed out at the potlatch. Um, and the lower right, again, this is the image from the, the start of this presentation. This is um, looking down the beach uh, westward. So um, Hadlock Bay proper is in the far right corner of this image that's sort of going into Hadlock Bay. Um, really beautiful image of the, the canoes pulled up in front of the potlatch house. Um, and I, I should also mention, you know, I, I put quite a few photos from this collection in this presentation. There are quite a few more. And if you're interested in researching this topic, um, these photos are on file with the Jamestown Squalum tribe. So you can reach out to Ali or uh, Bonnie Roos, a tribal librarian. Um, for assistance there. And then, of course, the originals are up at the Alaska State Libraries in Alaska. Um, Patsy, the potlatch giver, went around to the arrivals and distributed stores of crackers and other eatables so that every person present was supplied with food and shelter. Um, you can see by this point in 1890, uh, we've got this really interesting mix of both traditional and non-traditional um, temporary structures, or you've got um, sort of your typical canvas tents that would have been acquired through trade with, um, with non-native 
traders coming from uh, probably San Francisco and, and other locations farther south along the West Coast. However, if you look at the image on the right side of your screen, you see the two um, sort of standard canvas tents. If you look just to the right of that, you can actually see a framework built out of uh, cedar poles. And that's actually more representative of what the traditional um, temporary seasonal encampment structure would have looked like was a framework, just a stick built frame made by, you know, inch and a half to two inch wide uh, saplings. And then that actually would have been covered with either um, cedar mats or tule mats uh, that would have been laid over that framework to basically block off uh, wherever the whichever direction the wind was coming, they would drape mats over that side to block the wind. Um, you could use it to block the sun if you didn't want to get sun. So um, really flexible structures that allowed um, the the tribes to adjust, you know, basically what they were covering and how they were covering dependent on on climactic conditions. Um, so you've got a really cool mix of sort of traditional non traditional in one image. Um, and same kind of goes goes for the outfits. You can see at this point, um, the calico dresses were pretty popular with the women. Um, the men are wearing uh, uh, bowling bowler hats um, and suits. Um, and the women are carrying, uh, you can see in the, the image on the right, the, the baby is strapped to her back using uh, probably some form of, of cotton cloth. Um, just a really cool picture of the encampment and people uh, getting ready. Uh, in the image on the left side of your screen, you can actually see on the far left side of that image, some of those mats, um, either tule or cedar mats um, laying there. And then actually the woman in the middle of the picture is carrying some sort of goods, I, I can't tell exactly what, that are rolled up within one of those mats themselves. Um, and those mats were used, you know, you would use them to cover the structures, you would use them to cover things in a canoe when you're paddling and didn't want them to get wet. Um, you could use those for um, uh, sitting on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so moving into the potlatch house, um, from Wickersham's description, there was a door at each end for the entrance and exits. Uh, there was no window and there wasn't really, there wasn't one needed because of the light that came in through the sailcloth. Um, at night, the building was lit by coal oil lamps fastened to the posts that ran down the center of the room. Uh, on either side, along the full length of the building was a shelf-like platform um, about two feet high and four feet wide. Um, and that's, we, you know, that, that was the way that longhouses were traditionally built with that bench running around the outside. That was also the sleeping platforms. Um, and so, you know, it would be different uses in daytime or nighttime. Um, you could store things underneath those, those platforms, um, and then usually there would have been another series of platforms running around the, the roof line where uh, additional baskets and bent wood boxes full of um, preserved food and other goods could be stored for uh, winter. Um, and it's kind of hard to see in this image on the left side, but you can see that it, there's actually, you know, 500 people sitting around the edge of the this inside of this building with this really cool open space in the middle. Um, and then in the top right image, what you're seeing is the beginning of the actual um, ceremony where you've got um, Shupalat or old Patsy um, along with his, his family members and then a few designated individuals who are assisting them with the potlatch begin calling out individuals' names to come receive their gifts. Um, Two more really, really cool photos. Yeah, like I said earlier, most of these photos don't have um, names for the individuals in the photos, unfortunately. However, one of the photos that we do have with names is this one on the left side of the screen, which is actually Siamitsa, who is uh, also known as Queen Victoria or the wife of Cheech Mahan out digging clams on Hadlock Bay. Um, and then the image on the right side is those clams being smoked over a fire, um, cooked over a fire. Uh, and so I think, um, and there's there's more photos in these series of the women out digging clams for the festivities. Uh, from the quote, I, this always makes me chuckle, uh, because this was right on 4th of July, which is already a pretty big um, festival uh, for the United States, the, the new country of the United States. Um, late in that evening, the Indians began to congregate upon the potlatch ground from the Boston man's 4th of July festivities. Uh, so basically, during the day, uh, 
all the tribal folks packed up in their canoes and went over to Port Townsend and enjoyed the Boston man, which is, also means white man's festivities in Port Townsend. Um, and then at the end of the day, everybody got in the canoes and then paddled back over to Hadlock for the potlatch. Um, um, the potlatch given by the Qualum people is expected to be the grandest for many years. Um, so it, you can see in some of these photos, some of the quote Caucasian visitors that were brought back over from Port Townsend to enjoy the potlatch festivities. Um, the term Siwash, I wanted, I wanted to make sure that I didn't try to um, change, change the text and I, I wanted to, it to remain authentic. So I, I think it's worthy of an explanation. The term Siwash is seen applied to native peoples in the Pacific Northwest and a lot of historic sources. Um, the term comes from, um, was used in Chinook jargon, but actually is, is sort of a, um, uh, an adapted version of uh, basically the French version of using Sauvage or Savage to apply to native peoples um, or tribal peoples. And so, um, that's that's sort of the terminology that was used throughout this account. And so I didn't want to change it, but I did want to explain um, sort of the racist connotations that come across with that terminology and, and why it's not used today. Um, but some really cool group shots of folks uh, getting ready for the festivities. Um, the dance began early in the evening and between the songs and dances, different uh, elders would make speeches in their native tongues of a character to excite the dancers all the more. I, I love this quote. The glories of the Klallam nation were recounted, the daring of the Macaw whale hunters, of Quileute elk slayers, of Snohomish salmon catchers, and of the various feats of daring performed by various individual members of their tribe were retold to an interested and thoroughly appreciative audience. The dancing waxed faster and the music louder as the songs and oft-repeated tales warmed the blood of the listeners. The Siwash audience applauded each new song and shouted with pride at every tale of glory. Um, and so uh, for those of you who have been lucky enough to attend a tribal canoe journey, um, you're probably familiar with the, uh, the protocol that goes on at the end of the canoe journey, um, which, is, which occurs in a very similar manner to um, the, the way that these potlatches traditionally occurred, which is, um, every tribe or every family that was invited to the potlatch had an opportunity to get up and share their stories and songs with the audience. Um, and so everybody's given an opportunity to speak, um, to share um, before things move into the, the gift giving phase. Um, and the image on the right side of your screen, if you look closely on the ground, you can actually see um, a bunch of gold coins laid out as they're getting ready uh, to start basically doling out um, cash and other gifts to um, the, the guest of the potlatch. Uh, and again, we don't have the names of the individuals in this photo, but I think it's safe to assume that at least one of them is old Patsy and one of them is young Patsy and one of them is uh, uh, old Patsy's wife, Jenny. Um, she might possibly be the woman with her back to the, the photographer in this image. Bright and early on Sunday morning, the potlatch proper began. The visitors had performed their part and were now merely waiting for Shupal to do his. At the west end of the hall, boxes and packages were broken open and the contents arranged on the floor by Shupal and his friend Skokomish Jim or Didiqua. Great bolts of calico of the hues so pleasing to the Indian eye were lining unrolled and cut into lengths sufficient for a dress by the women. Uh, old Patsy's wife, Jenny, distributing more than 1,500 yards of new calico to the friends of her husband, Patsy, which is not an insignificant amount of calico, 1,500 yards. It's about a mile of calico. Um, and you can see, again, it's very difficult to see in the, the image on the right side of your screen, but that is actually um, an individual holding some of those bolts of cloth in their arm. Um, you can't really tell if it's a man or a woman. It's too dark in the image, but... Um, uh, yeah, just really cool photos. Uh, during the time of the distribution of the calico, Patsy stole, stood amid the packages of goods and spoke to the people. He told them how much he loved his friends and spoke particularly of many with whom he had been raised. 
And when he referred to his age and numerous friends who were dead and of the possibility that he would never again meet those who were present at the potlatch, he broke down and cried. And many an old Indian from around the room showed equal signs of feeling and sympathy. A fitting reply was made to Patsy's speech by an Indian who was applauded when he spoke of Patsy's generosity and of the honor due him for giving the potlatch. Um, I, I have not been able to figure out exactly who General George Washington is. Um, General George Washington is a term applied similar to how Duke of York was applied to Chief Chichmahan or Chetsamoka. Um, these terms uh, relating back to either English aristocracy or significant um, figures in the history of the United States um, government were applied to uh, Native American individuals for uh, whose names could not be pronounced by English speaking non-natives. So um, basically what they would do is instead of using the appropriate and, and real native name of an individual, um, they would apply these terms as sort of a, a, a nickname. Um, so unfortunately, I haven't been able to figure out the, the traditional name of, of who General George Washington is, but hopefully someday we can we can do that. Uh, the, or I'm sorry, I said gold coin, I misspoke. The money was entirely in silver. Uh, the bags containing it were carried to the center of the room and poured out on the floor. Uh, young Patsy furnished about one third of the money. And from that, <clears throat> and from the interest that uh, Aunt Sally, which uh, again, Aunt Sally, similar to um, Duke of York, George Washington, those sort of things. Um, the term Aunt Sally was a term applied to um, uh, elderly native women um, instead of using their proper or appropriate name. Um, I believe her name was actually Jenny, um, and this term Aunt Sally was just being uh, used colloquially. Um, but it, by the interest that she exhibited in this part of the se se excuse me, ceremony, it was clear to uh, the author's mind that she too had assisted in gathering the purse. Um, these three squatted around the pile and assisted by, uh, by oh, that should say uh, Skokomish Jim, they sorted the money into various little heaps, which is what you can see going on. Um, so, I, and again, this is just theorizing, but in the image on the left side of the screen, um, the woman with uh, her back to the photographer is most likely uh, Jenny, uh, Patsy's wife. And then you can see directly in front of her is a, uh, an elderly gentleman wearing a hat. And you can see he's got a white mustache and goatee. Um, that individual uh, shows up in many, many of these photos right around the gifts. And so um, my theory is that that's possibly old Patsy. But again, without a name in the captions, it's, it's kind of impossible to know. Um, but between the two of them and then the, the younger gentleman with the hat on and the suspenders um, directly in front of the guy that I think is old Patsy, I, I believe those three to be the, the Patsy family, but unfortunately without a, a clear caption stating as much, we can't say that. Eyewash. Uh, slowly and carefully, the whole of Patsy's money was distributed in this way to his friends, and by two o'clock in the afternoon, no one was so poor as Patsy. The saving of a lifetime had been potlatched to his friends. Uh, about $2,000 in cash had been given away in one day, and his entire worldly possessions now consisted of his family and the clothes upon his back. But he had gained social distinction. Um, and this is important to note, you know, within the, the tradition of potlatches, um, the there are many reasons why somebody might host a potlatch. It could be done around a significant event, um, you know, a, a naming ceremony or the, the birth of a, a child, um, um, a significant wedding, something like that. Um, in this case, this was sort of um, Patsy's, Patsy's way of, of building his family's prestige as he moved into his next phase of life where um, he was no longer working, uh, no longer acquiring wealth um, in that sort of a sense. And so uh, essentially by giving his wealth away to his friends and acquaintances, um, he built his personal prestige and the prestige of his family um, and that of his son and his descendants. Um, and so uh, you can see, you know, 
in later years, potlatching uh, was was uh, outlawed uh, in Canada and in the United States. Um, it wasn't so much formally outlawed as it was uh, um, the the various Indian Indian agents who controlled the the Indian agencies, like at Skokomish, for example, um, made it their policy to stop potlatches from happening because it's really hard to convince um, an entire uh, an entire uh, all of these different tribes to convert to this new capitalist system when their culture and traditions are oriented around sharing wealth, sharing resources, and using that sharing to build connections. Um, you know, it's sort of the, the complete polar opposite of capitalism, which is like hoard wealth for your own personal benefit. Um, and so for these reasons, amongst others, um, unfortunately, potlatching was, was, um, um, it was, it was made almost impossible, if not impossible, for tribes to continue potlatching through the early 20th century. Um, and a lot of those traditions are now experiencing a renaissance. Um, and the, the Canoe Journey Protocol are a great example of that renaissance happening in real time um, in, today, in today's society. Uh, at the moment the last do dollar was potlatched, the meeting broke up and everyone hastened to load the canoes for departure. Um, really like the, the quote at the end of this, um, after the last canoe had pushed off, uh, Jenny, the wife of old Patsy, uh, struck up a song in glory of Patsy, the potlatch giver, um, and accompanied her voice by beating upon a board as a, you know, drumming on a board, um, and a group gathered around her and assisted, uh, her to the best of their ability, and for a short time she continued to sing and dance, and then uh, when she finished the potlatch was ended. And I believe that's a photo of uh, Jenny Patsy there on the left side of the screen. Um, and there on the right side, you can see everybody sort of piling out and getting ready to hop back in canoes um, and head back to their villages. And so I wanted to finish off with a with a little note on on what happened. Um, I and I I truly wish that I had been able to come up with a, a better quality image than the one that's on this screen. Um, but if you squint very closely, you can see there's there's a potlatch. Well, actually, in the top right uh, corner of this image, you can see the very top of the old alcohol plant there at Hadlock. And if you look directly down from the old alcohol plant, you can see. Um, a small longhouse building. And if you squint really hard sitting in front of that longhouse is the Prince of Wales, Lehanum, and his wife. She's wearing a white, um, a white outfit. He's to the right of her with a white shirt with a black vest. So they kind of just look like tiny little blobs. Um, but that's them sitting in front of their uh, longhouse there at, at Hadlock in 1941. Uh, right where that uh, that potlatch occurred. Um, this statement is from uh, Joseph and Navon Waterhouse, um, Joseph Waterhouse from the uh, Port Gamble Squalum tribe, um, and they uh, wrote up a report on the cultural resources at Hadlock. And according to um, their account, when Joseph was a boy, uh, he lived with his great uncle Lehanum, the Prince of Wales, um, at Hadlock in a cabin on a beach just below the site of the alcohol plant, which is that cabin in this image. Um, so according to uh, Joe Waterhouse, who, who lived at the site, grew up there, um, the young Patsy and his wife Jenny uh, lived on the land until they died in the early 1950s. Um, their son Francis also raised his family on that site in Hadlock. Um, Joe Waterhouse himself lived in a cabin that had been attached to the west end of the last longhouse until he and his family moved around the sand, sandstone point to the mill pond, um, which is sort of the, uh, what we would call Hadlock Bay now. Um, all of the wood from the structures is eventually carried away, um, but in the winter you can still see an outline in the beach grass and sand where the old longhouse stood that it, uh, is about 100 feet long and 30 feet wide, basically the, the potlatch house we were looking at the, in the images in the first slide. Um, 
So I think that's about it. These are some of my uh, sources. And again, uh, if you're interested in, in the more detailed account of this, um, if you just Google uh, History of Washington, the Evergreen State from Early Dawn to Daylight, um, you can find an account of that uh, available online through the, it's the US archives. Um, and you can find the full text of that online. Uh, and the photos are from the Alaska State Library. Uh, ASL MS 107 is the record series. Um, and if you're interested in sort of a more up close look, uh, we're actually going to be doing our final um, history hike program of 2022 on October 22nd at Irondale Beach. Um, if you're interested in signing up for that program, please visit uh, jchsmuseum.org. Um, and as always, if you would like to support the North Olympic History Center and the work we're doing in these programs, you can always donate to us. We really appreciate it. Um, so I will stop there and I will um, stop sharing my screen. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.